This is the Panasonic live stream about the new Lumix BGH1. Cinity, your digital cinema tech resource. New box camera from Panasonic announced two hours ago. And now we're about to hear the live stream. I mean, you see us live, but uh, we're about to hear the live stream from Panasonic. And thanks to Panasonic for the first time. Together with Panasonic, we are also allowed to present their live stream in our channel. And we just thought we just share some of our thoughts with you before we actually switch over to Panasonic. So, Johnny, what do you think about this little box? Panasonic Lumix GH5S. And that's what happens when you try a completely new concept. And I think this is that's what's interesting. Besides the camera, which has a lot of uh, possibilities, I think what is really interesting is the concept. Concept, I, I mean, if this is being accepted well in the market, that means that Panasonic can do this smaller, bigger, different sensor sizes, and so on. So I think it's a it's a it's a it's a new beginning of something. Let's see how the market uh, will react to this. I think it's nice that finally we see mainstream manufacturers moving into this kind of camera brain format that we talked about years ago where we were like, okay, well, we have all these photo cameras that shoot amazing video, but they're really still predominantly still kind of photo cameras. Why can't you just put the same technology into something that we can build up to whatever we need? And now we see this, we've seen it from others. Now we see it also from Panasonic, which is, I guess, the first well, the second mainstream company that tries this, I guess. That's yeah. right. I think Black Magic Design was the first one. Sony also did one. They had a, a box shape. Even Canon had one, but it wasn't very successful. A very expensive yeah. box shape More based like on the C three hundred. But this is, I mean, this is an entry level in terms of 2, market. Two thousand US dollars. Two thousand dollars. Insane. But it doesn't have any monitoring, so you need to attach. I mean, it has a lot of mounting points, so you can attach a lot of different stuff, monitors, viewfinders, whatever you want. Yeah, just very, very quickly. Um, same battery as the uh, EVA one. It's a more B2B, like business to business uh, product, meaning it will not be sold with the battery or charger. That's uh, important to uh, to remember. Um, connectivity, really full, uh, what is this now? Full connectivity. It's really amazing how, how much um, SDIs, uh, yeah. Yeah, everything that you need. It's the first time that the Lumix camera can output simultaneously uh, to the HDMI and SDI. Uh, although HDMI can output 4K and the SDI only full HD. Um, but other than that... I think we have 4K up to 60p in uh, DCI. Um, we have up to 240 frames in full HD, which is nice too. So very good slow motion. But the 60p in 4K is nice because that's something we still don't have on all the high-end camera I like the top flagship cameras from all manufacturers i mean it is only a micro four thirds size sensor but again you can use it i guess with a speed booster and you know just yeah. pump it up to the sensor circle of almost like super 35 kind of yeah but just to be precise if we're already talking about frame rates and resolution um the camera can do up to 30p in all i 10 bit, sorry, all i intra 10 bit internally. But if you move to the uh, 50 and 60p, this is 8 bit in long gop. But again, you can, of course, record externally and then you have it uh, uh, like full 10 bit. Good. I think this is more like a. a yeah. I, ca I can't close it. I can't, can't close, close it. it. We have oh, to tell Panasonic God. to change the plastics. Yeah, we'll fix it. <laughs> well, anyway, we have to switch over to the live stream. It's time. Uh, just let's see what Panasonic has to say about this. I'm sure they will also show a lot of applications of it. So enjoy the live stream. Please comment below the video. Actually, Panasonic is also monitoring our live stream today. So if you have any questions, please post them as a comment in the live stream or in the chat and they will actually refer to it at the end of their yeah. presentation. So they're not only looking at their own live stream, but also at our live stream. So yeah, thanks for watching and thank you guys. Enjoy. And see you so actually see you very, very soon. I think much sooner than you can imagine. There's so much happening this week. That's see crazy. you. Welcome to a special edition of Lumix Live. For today's event, we at Panasonic Lumix are proud to present a new category of camera for the Lumix Micro Four Thirds system. Throughout this presentation, our team will be monitoring the questions that you have. So make sure to tag at Lumix Cameras before your question so we can address them at the end during our Q&A session. 
Without further ado, I would like to introduce Matt Frazier, Business Development Manager for Lumix USA. Take it away, Matt. Thank you, Sean. I am pleased to announce the newest Lumix camera, the BGH-1. Designed from the ground up as a production video camera, the BGH-1 uses a video-optimized, high-sensitivity sensor with 10.2 megapixels and incorporates our legendary dual-native ISO system, adopted from the Vericam and S1H cameras. This combination delivers some of the best low-light video you're going to find in a micro four-thirds camera. The BGH-1 will offer advanced video codecs, including an all-eye codec, capturing up to 400 megabits per second, and you can record 4K video at up to 60 frames per second in 10-bit, and you also have access to 422 color sample. The BGH-1 is a cinematographer's dream with features like anamorphic capture, access to shutter angle, and of course, the BGH-1 will include Vlog L with improved dynamic range over the GH5 and GH5S. One full stop more dynamic range in the highlights to give you more recoverable information. For autofocus, the BGH-1 uses the autofocus system developed for the Panasonic S5 with one notable advantage. The BGH-1 uses a lightning fast micro four thirds sensor, giving it impressive autofocus in all frame rates and resolutions. The BGH-1 camera is designed for a professional workflow, so overheating would be completely unacceptable. The BGH-1 uses a combination of aluminum and magnesium in its chassis with an integrated fan to allow the camera to record in all frame rates and resolutions for an unlimited recording time at temperatures all the way up to 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's 40 degrees Celsius. To ensure maximum flexibility, the BGH-1 camera includes professional terminals like a 3G SDI terminal, a timecode terminal, a Genlock terminal, and also includes dual SD card slots that are both UHS-2 compatible. In addition, you'll also get a full-size HDMI port with the ability to output images simultaneously over 3G SDI and HDMI. For audio, the camera includes a stereo microphone system, a headphone jack, a microphone jack, and is fully compatible with the XLR1 XLR audio adapter. And last but not least, the BGH-1 also incorporates a USB-C port as well as an Ethernet port. Now let's go back to Sean to discuss the possibilities provided by these two ports. Take it away, Sean. Thanks, Matt. For me, some of the most exciting things about this camera originate from the USB-C and the Ethernet connections. So let's start with the USB-C webcam compatibility. With the USB-C interface, the Lumix BGH-1 can be used as a traditional webcam utilizing the brand new Lumix webcam software drivers for Mac or Windows. This truly offers a plug and play experience for those that just need an ability to view a camera feed in their popular webcasting or meeting services. In addition, the USB-C interface on the Lumix BGH-1 box camera gives the capability to use the Lumix Tether for Multicam app. This app provides an astonishing amount of control for those that want to broadcast their video feeds into encoding software of their choice. By using the interface included in the Lumix Tether for Multicam app, you'll also have full camera control too. Changing ISO, aperture, shutter speed, frame rates, and full menu access are now possible from the comfort of your chair. Did I mention broadcasting your video feeds, plural? The Lumix Tether for Multicam app won't just limit you to one camera. You'll be able to take full control of multiple cameras attached to your computer, so there's no need to physically go to each camera to change a simple setting anymore. Moving on to what I believe is the most forward-thinking part of the Lumix BGH-1 box camera, the Ethernet port. This port expands your capabilities for placement of the Lumix BGH-1 box camera by utilizing the PoE Plus power standard that's available on certain network switchers. In addition to all the functionality you get with the USB-C interface, you now have the capabilities to power this camera and send your video feed with one single cable, minimizing the need for additional power cables or extra HDMI, SDI cable runs for tricky camera placements. This unique feature will allow you to control up to 12 cameras via the Lumix Tether for Multicam app. And a future firmware update will provide IP video streaming over Ethernet via RTSP. Now, over the past few weeks, I've been using the Lumix BGH-1 camera for streaming our Lumix Live weekly events. 
And I can tell you this has massively simplified our streaming capabilities. By using just one connection from the camera via the Ethernet and PoE Plus power standard, I'm able to slim down my streaming hardware to a single cable coming off the back of my camera. And I can control it from the Lumix Tether for Multicam app. This is truly going to be a revolution for those looking to broaden their live streaming capabilities or those looking to simplify their studio multicam setups. So with that, I'm going to turn this back over to Matt Frazier to discuss the future firmware updates for the Lumix BGH1 box camera. Like all things Lumix, we're already working on future firmware updates to expand the capabilities of the BGH1, including RTSP compatibility. So stay tuned to all Panasonic Lumix social media for more information as it becomes available. Now for professional integrators who have specialized needs, Panasonic is releasing a software development kit, also known as an SDK, allowing you to develop your own solutions to control and monitor your camera. And this SDK is not only compatible with the BGH1, it's also compatible with the GH5, GH5S, G9, S5, S1, S1R, and of course the S1H. So as you can see, the Lumix BGH1 box camera can fill a large variety of production needs. From YouTubers looking to improve the quality of their productions, to live streamers looking for the ultimate in convenience and image quality, and live event productions that require cinematic quality images with industry standardized connections, the Lumix box camera truly does it all. Thanks, Matt. As a reminder for those joining us live, make sure to use the chat bars and tag at Lumix cameras for us to address your questions during the Q&A session at the end of the stream. Now, last week I was lucky enough to sit down virtually with three members from the product team in Japan responsible for the Lumix BGH1 box camera. This interview was to get a peek behind the curtain of what went into developing and designing the brand new Lumix camera. Let's hear what they had to say. This interview is being recorded as a virtual sit-down with members from our product development team in Japan. I'm joined by product planning leader, Mr. Aihara, project manager, Mr. Nakamura, and lead designer, Mr. Nishiwaki. Mr. Aihara, what were the design goals for developing and releasing this camera? Hi. 従来のルミックスは小型軽量でありながら高画質動画が撮影できるという点で好評を得てきました。形状は一眼形状であり、ハンドヘルドユースを中心に多くの方にご使用いただいてきました。ただ逆に従来のカメラの形状をしていることで制
応えていきたいと考えておりますし、また、本機能によって、今までルミックスを使用されたことがない、クリエイターの皆様にも、興味を持っていただけるチャンスだと思っております。Now, Mr. Nakamura, given the design goals of the camera, what challenges did you encounter and how did you solve them? Hi, Hofu Nakino to Hogata Kerio Bori no Lioris des. GH5S no Doga Se no Uiji, Ariwa Kojo Shinagara, Lumix Hatsonaru, SDI, Gen Lock, Ethernet to Itta Kino to Sai Shio to Suruto, Doshimo, Den Lufa Zoka Shi, Hasnes Gaka Dai to Narimas. Doga Kito Shite, Muse Gen Kilofu Ga Zeta Joken no Naka, User Hearing を通じて様々なユースケース、使い勝手を考えると、小型軽量も重要なポイントと認識していたため、その2つを両立させることは非常に大きなチャレンジでした。新規放熱ファンの搭載含めて、これまで培った放熱技術を駆使することで、GH5S 以下のサイズ、重量を実現できました。Just like a Vlog L Plus? はい、ハイライトについては実写評価でも GH5S 比較で白飛びしにくいことが確認できています。VGH1 は動画に特化したカメラですが、バリカムや S1H などのシネマカメラ開発で培った手作り思想、ノウハウを生かし、当社マイクロフォーサーズカメラとしては初の13ストップを実現しています。Mr. Nishuaki. Given the design goals of the camera, can you explain why this camera moved away from the traditional mirrorless design in favor of a box? And what benefits do you see this providing? BGH1's いろいろな用途で使えるカメラモジュールとして最適な形とは何かということを検討した結果必然的にこのようなシンプルなボックス形状になりましたでこの構軸を中心にシンメトリーになっているボックスフォルムは一眼カメラのようにグリップがこのようにないので例えばジンバルやドローンに搭載した時など容易にバランスを取ることができるというメリットがあります Can you provide some subtle design features that you've included that might not be immediately noticed? イベントやストリーミングでの複数台でのカメラコントロールやドキュメンタリーなどでのハンドヘルドでの撮影それからジンバルやドローンへの搭載などさまざまなユースケースを想定してデザインを検討しました例えば置き取りの時ですけれどもカメラを設置しておいてカメラから離れてしまうことになるので遠くからでも録画状態が目視で一目で確認できるように本体のこの角の部分に通常よりかなり大きめのタリーランプを配置していますそれから同じく置き取りの時ですけれども複数のカメラを置き取りする時はケーブルマネジメントも重要ですケーブルは全て背面方向から出せるようにして一つにまとめやすいようにすることでシンプルな配線になるようにしましたまたこのカメラはケンジントンロックをここに取り付けることができるようになっていますこれは私自身の撮影の経験からも感じたことですけれども、屋外のイベントで複数のカメラを設置したときに、カメラから離れてしまうことに少し不安を感じたことがあります。ですので、セキュリティ面の配慮も必要と思いまして、ケンジントンロックをここに取り付けられるようにしました。それから、えー、デザイン面の基本造形ですけれども、シンプルな箱からこの角を削り取ったような形状になっています。これは、えー、操作性に配慮した結果、生まれた形状です。これらのカット面は手に持ったときに角が当たらないようにするとともにボタンにアクセスしやすいようになっています。So for my last question,、uh, did you conduct professional user surveys during the development process? And if so, are there any designs or functions that reflect the feedback you got from them? はい、例えば本体全集にはこのようにネジを、えー、配置しています。これはリグを取り付けるときに一眼のカメラのようなこの側面の三脚コーナーだけではなくて側面とか天面からでも固定することでしっかりと取り付いてガタつきをなくすというためのものですまた VR のように複数のカメラをこうケージに組むときも周囲のネジがある方が良いという配慮ですまたこのネジですけれどもドローンにカスタムで搭載するときにネジが少しでも飛び出しているとガタつきの原因になるという指摘がありましたので極力段差を少なくするなど調整してきましたこのようにいただいた意見を生かして細かい調整をしてきています
I want to thank the team in Japan for taking the time out of their day to provide us some insight into the development of this camera. It's clear from day one that the Lumix BGH-1 box camera was designed to be in a category of its own and provide the most flexible Lumix camera to date. But I know a lot of you want to see what this camera can do in the hands of creators. So before we go any further with the conversation, let's see how this camera performs in the real world. Across the board, whether it's a big TV show or a documentary, there is always somehow a reason that we need to get into a small space. The qualifiers of this camera that, that makes it different from all of the other cameras that people have been trying to make sure to get on FPV drones is its form factor, the weight, and of course the amazing quality footage that it can capture. My initial reaction to this camera was, wow, they have finally created something that can capture all my beauty. It's a lot going on. So to get a camera that can capture literally all of me on a streaming platform, they, they hit the nail on the head with this one. So with this pandemic that has hit, it has been very tough to be in the live event business. The shift or the opportunity that comes is of course virtual to have the ability to take the same camera that we would shoot live events and then go virtual and do an online experience with the same camera, game changer. So with all cameras, you have drawbacks on one side or the other. You can either have a camera whose image quality is amazing, but the ergonomics are not. Or on the other side of that, you have a camera that might be sort of built for ergonomics, but the image quality is lacking. So to have something that takes both of those things and puts it all into one little box is helpful. The box camera from Panasonic is very unique uh, in the sense that it's, it's, it's perfectly suited for a multitude of different things. I mean, you could use it on small gimbals, um, car mounts, obviously, inside and outside, and drone definitely being one of them. You know, it's the most ergonomic camera I've ever used on a drone. The box camera is the first time that I've seen the components that we need. SDI cables, the inputs, the gen lock, the fact that we have all of those components and be able to plug in an ethernet cable into this camera, it's a huge, huge thing for our business. I like the fact that I can take this box and custom build my own system and it's just a perfect opportunity for us to get the most out of a camera, both live and virtually. When you've been working with DSLRs and then you go to a front-facing camera on your laptop, you, you're literally going back to like 720. To have something that could, you know, take your, your, your content to eons above where it currently is, just on quality alone, but not have to sacrifice that space is a game changer. The build quality of this camera is incredible. It felt like something that was tough that you could still play with. You know, it's a toy, but it's a, it's a solid toy. Action cameras are designed to take a beating, to be there in the middle of the action. Cinema grade cameras are frail. This is the first step into a cinema grade camera that is built solid and can take a beating and it applies perfect to what we're doing here. With this camera, they've broken it down so you've got the simplest aspect of what a camera is. And what that's doing is magnifying the possibilities for the cinematographer using it. Not every job that we do is the same. So the fact that we were able to go shoot a scene in a movie and then use that same camera to go do a multi-cam live event and use that same camera to go shoot a commercial, I've never seen anything like it. Panasonic. Today I'm joined by the filmmakers who were responsible for the piece that you just watched. Uh, we're going to go over a bit of a Q&A session here to, you know, kind of cover their first-hand experiences with the cameras after the projects that they were working on. So I'm joined by David C. Smith to hear more and Jean Tyson. So with that out of the way, let's give the viewers a bit of a background as to who you are and what production or video creation you do. Uh, let's start with David. Sure, sure. 
Um, so I'm a cinematographer by trade, uh, but for about the last 10 years, I've run a company called drivingplates.com, uh, and we're the world's largest library of 360 degree moving environments uh, for car scenes. So if a, if a film or a TV show needs to put an actor in a car, uh, we do that on a green screen stage or on an LED stage. And my company provides everything that's outside the window. Uh, so it's kind of like Google Street View on steroids. Uh, and since the beginning of the company, we've always used the, the Lumix line of cameras uh, to create that footage. Um, so as such, we always do you know, nine, ten camera arrays uh, by combining a bunch of Lumix cameras together. Uh, and as such, we've basically been able to put Lumix footage into now over 750 television programs, feature films, Academy Award nominees, all that. So um, we've kind of been a, a little bit of a pioneer in using these small cameras in big cinema production. Um, and so the box camera is, is, is kind of the camera we've been waiting for um, because it finally gives us Genlock, it gives us SDI. Uh, it, it basically now lets us dovetail into a professional set in a way that the, uh, the GH line of, of DSLRs uh, was always a little bit challenging because we only had HDMI. And uh, to here, can you give everyone a background? I've never seen anything like it. Panasonic. Today I'm joined by the filmmakers who were responsible for the piece that you just watched. Uh, we're going to go over a bit of a Q&A session here to, you know, kind of cover their first-hand experiences with the cameras after the projects that they were working on. So I'm joined by David C. Smith to hear more and Jean Tyson. So with that out of the way, let's give the viewers a bit of a background as to who you are and what production or video creation you do. Uh, let's start with David. Sure, sure. Um, so I'm a cinematographer by trade, uh, but for about the last 10 years, I've run a company called drivingplates.com, uh, and we're the world's largest library of 360 degree moving environments, uh, for car scenes. So if a, if a film or a TV show needs to put an actor in a car, uh, we do that on a green screen stage or on an LED stage. And my company provides everything that's outside the window. Uh, so it's kind of like Google street view on steroids. Uh, and since the beginning of the company, we've always used the, the Lumix line of cameras uh, to create that footage. Um, so as such, we always do you know, nine, ten camera arrays uh, by combining a bunch of Lumix cameras together. Uh, and as such, we've basically been able to put Lumix footage into now over 750 television programs, feature films, Academy Award nominees, all that. So um, we've kind of been a, a little bit of a pioneer in using these small cameras in big cinema production. Um, and so the box camera is, is, is kind of the camera we've been waiting for um, because it finally gives us Genlock, it gives us SDI. Uh, it, it basically now lets us dovetail into a professional set in a way that the, uh, the GH line of, of DSLRs uh, was always a little bit challenging because we only had HDMI. And uh, to here, can you give everyone a background on who you are and what you do? Absolutely, Sean. I look forward to it. Thank you for asking. Uh, I just want to. I just want to uh, set the expectations to lower your bar. Uh, David was talking some 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 jargon, and I was just like, "What? What is he even saying?" I make internet videos. I make content for quick consumption. Uh, I host a late night show Monday through Thursdays. I host a music show, and then I do a lot of. Uh, content creation with big companies like All Def Digital, uh, um, BuzzFeed, and a couple other companies. But uh, I make quick content that I usually shoot on my phone just because it's quick and easy to grab. Like, I don't have to set up 16 tripods, anything like that, um, because it's generally just me. Like I will play all the roles in every one of my sketches because I don't feel like you know, dealing with scheduling and all of that type of stuff. So that's why my night show works so well because it's via Zoom and everybody can just sit down at the house. Um, but to use uh, the box camera, it was so amazing because it just it just brought a different type of quality to it. And I mean, like anytime you're using like your phone or Zoom, you're gonna lose a, a nice amount of quality already. Um, but with this box camera, to be able to, to stream and to uh, and that clarity and, and be able to give the people I feel like the best um, that they should and could get was it was it was great man and I, I really wish that uh, you guys had let me keep it for like I don't know maybe like six months 
You know, nothing excessive. Just like six months, I get it, it was limited, but you know, how many black guys with freckles and red hair do you see? I'm kind of limited too, so. <laughs> I thought it was a match made in heaven. <laughs> With that, we, we, we uh, definitely need to keep in touch with all this stuff, too. Absolutely. So, yeah. I look forward to it. <laughs> um, John, uh, could, could you give us a little bit of a background with you as well? Sure. I'm a cinematographer in Los Angeles, and I work on a big variety of projects, everything from uh, feature documentaries to big network TV and um, everything in between, which is a lot. <laughs> you know, web series, shorts, anything that really uh, people, if, if someone has an interesting story to tell and they want me to be their cinematographer, I'm always eager and excited to go do it. So after working through the projects that you guys had the cameras for, uh, what is the one standout feature that really stuck with you after the productions? Uh, to hear. Um, what really stuck with me after the production would probably just be the quality of it, man. Um, I guess I'll say the quality and the simplicity of it. Like, to have a plug-and-go type of camera with that type of quality uh, and no big production was amazing. Especially for somebody like me. Like, I'm shooting literally every day of the week. Like, I don't take any days off. So, to be able to just wake up, crack on with my laptop, plug in the camera, and press record, that is... That's perfect for me uh, during this current state. So uh, that's what I loved about it, how simple it was and how quality the, the video image was. And uh, what about you, Jean? For me, it was the flexibility of it, um, being able to take a camera that's, you know, the size of my two hands and I can just put it anywhere that I need to, um, but also attach a cinema lens to it so that I'm, I'm capturing quality as well that I can then cut into anything that I'm working on, whether that be a film or a TV show. Um, you don't find that very often. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, David, what about you? Uh, sure. So for me, it was really about uh, the interconnectivity. So the fact that we have now finally in a small form factor camera, uh, SDI, Genlock, uh, the ability to go networked, um, both power over Ethernet, uh, and signal over Ethernet. So it's all of that interconnected uh, capability where the camera can fit into so many different situations. Uh, you know, with DSLRs, we're used to having good image quality in a small format camera, but that's always been sacrificing the ability to, to have professional interfaces. And so finally, we get the best of, best of both worlds with this camera. So how does everybody feel the image quality was compared to the cameras that you're normally shooting with? Um, let's start with David for this one. Sure. I mean, it's, uh, the, the nice thing here is that you're, you're, you're able to put the box camera into a use scenario where a lot of times people are right now using webcams. So right now doing live conferences like we're doing here uh, it has become a big part of society because of what's going on. Um, and so that's usually been webcams on people's laptops or cell phones. And, and those cameras being so tiny and, you know, uh, really not designed for image quality, uh, being able to step up to something with a larger chip, something that has proper color, uh, you know, a good codecs, uh, all of that now just gives us a much better ability uh, to, to interact live with each other, but still do so in a cinematic way. Cool, cool. Um, John, what, what about you? Well, again, it's for me really about having a specific scene that it may play out in a larger project, again, film or TV. Um, for instance, I worked on the scene where we were in a car, and, you know, my camera that I'm working with right now on the TV show that I'm working on is, like, this large. <laughs> you know, it's huge. And putting that in a car that even if it's a giant one it's just not gonna work and so to be able to take this little tiny camera and get the angle that I want to get that's actually an interesting angle that helps me tell the story um, is such a huge deal for us as filmmakers and storytellers we want to we want to be specific about where we're putting the camera and you can't do that when your camera's this big and you're in a space that's this big you know um, but with this little camera you can actually say oh you know what actually I want that really cool low angle you know on the driver as she's speeding through the neighborhood you know uh, for whatever reason <laughs> and um, and it just it works and to be able to then take that image 
um, and cut it in with my cinema camera that I'm using for the rest of the job um, is really significant. You know, you can, of course, you're going to have to do some color correcting like we do with everything, um, but it's there. The image quality is there and you can actually make it fit seamlessly in with your project. Cool, cool. Uh, what about you, Tier? I feel like you guys tricked me, man. I'm going to be honest with you. Like, you gave me that camera, and the day that we did my show with that camera, everybody was like, oh, my God, what's going on? How does it look this crisp? How does it look this clear? And then the next day, I went back to the regular camera, and everybody's like, oh, how did I ever watch this before? And I'm like, wow, this is... This is what you guys did to me. And I've tried to block that day out of my memory because I feel so, like, just betrayed by you guys. How do you create this amazing technology and then strip it away from me with no one? I was like, oh, they're giving me a camera. It's like, no, they're giving it to you for one day, okay, to so have at it. And uh, it just makes me excited about, like, what the future holds, man. Like, we're able to get, like everybody else has kind of touched on, this type of quality through streaming has never been seen before. And my, my life right now is streaming. So like, this is just like, it, it, it feels like being in the front row of a roller coaster right when it's about to like hit that first dip. Like I'm in the front seat of something so amazing, so exciting, so fun. Uh, it was just, it was, it was, it was great. It was a great time. You know, I'm, curious to hear that with streaming for the camera, um, and again, I know we touched on this a little bit already, but why is it so important to up the image quality in your opinion? Well, you know, I, I think um, the importance of upping the image quality really lays on keeping the audience entertained and locked in. Like, to be able to produce a show from my house and garner anywhere from 1,500 to 6,000 live views that night. Like, this, this is literally between 1,500 and 6,000 people watching at that moment. You want to stand apart. You want to, you know, you know uh, uh, separate yourself from the other people that might have events or, or, or shows going on at that time. And truly, you, you can, there are a number of platforms that people can turn to for entertainment, but if you're providing not only the entertainment, but the quality, of entertainment and the, the visuals are uh, are hot top tier like why would they not want to watch you so that not only engages the audience but it also keeps them coming back looking for more because you're basically a tv show online like i am i'm my own netflix now at this point because of this quality and i feel good about that i feel really good about that it's opened a lot of doors for me now i'm also doing headshots for people who do online dating and that that never would have happened you know, without this camera. So I just, you know, you know, just multiple streams of income. <laughs> so we've been saying, you know, how everything's been adapted and having a tool that has a broad use for not just streaming, but other applications is important these days. So I want to ask you, David, knowing that you do a lot more major motion picture work that you were talking about with the GH series, what was the main features in the BGH1 that really excited you for the projects that you're working on? Sure. Um, yeah, it, the form factor is a big part of it. The fact that we basically have a little four inch cube uh, and that it's it's stripped down. It's it's. I, I've always made the the statement that a camera is just a box with a hole in it, um, and now that's that's very literally what we have. So by taking all of the, um, stripping it down to the, the most core basic functions of what the camera is, means that I then get to build the camera up to be the camera that I need at any given moment. Uh, and for one project to the next, that's gonna be radically different. Um, and so a lot of times when you're using, uh, you know, cameras that are designed for a specific use case, you, when, you, when you deviate from that use case, the camera starts fighting you. Um, and, and the box camera really gets out of the way and lets me create it. Uh, it's, it's like a, a, a set of Legos. I can basically build up whatever camera I want. Um, so it, it's that adaptability, I think, that is, is really, uh, really crucial. And, and we've been enjoying it a lot. Like we've, we've had a chance to use it now in a lot of situations. Uh, and with the video, that was something we really wanted to try and show was here's a bunch of different filmmakers using it in different ways. And uh, I think that's really its biggest strength for us. Now, kind of dovetailing with that, uh, Jean, you commented before that 
being able to put the camera into more tight spaces where you know the standard cinema cameras can't go. Could you dive into more detail on that and why it's important for those that don't understand how actual production may work normally? Sure, yeah. Um, you know, I, like I said, it's all about telling the story. And sometimes, you know, it makes sense to do your traditional coverage where people are either standing or sitting normally and you have plenty of space to, you know, put the cameras around them and tell the story that way. Um, in other situations, you may have someone in a space or in a state that makes you want to put the camera somewhere that, again, a, a giant camera is just not going to fit, um, or in an angle that it's not going to quite work, or on a device, for instance, uh, rolling down a gurney and it's somebody's POV. Um, you you kind of want that angle, and again, with my camera that is normally you know the size of my body, <laughs> and trying to sit you know upside down, holding it handheld, like it's just it's not um, going to to work out. But when you now have a tiny camera that I can take the same lens or a smaller prime lens, perhaps, <laughs> and put that on this little camera and, and then get myself into the position where I need to be in order to best tell that story of that particular character, um, it's going to be great. Along with image quality, though, the other thing that it provides us is, um, as kind of these guys are talking about, is connectivity and being able to um, connect to what we are used to. It fits into what we're used to using on a set in TV uh, and in movies where I can now connect it to my wireless you know transmission device that then sends it to Video Village where I've got you know DPs looking at it, I've got directors looking at it, producers, writers, everybody's able to watch now the shot that we've designed because it's connecting to our you know, system, <laughs> just like our other cameras do, and that's not something you could do with other little cameras that were sort of, you know, they sort of thought of this idea of like, oh, I want to get the camera in a, sm a small space. Well, you could, like David was saying with the G8 series, you could do that, but then you couldn't broadcast it to everybody who needs to watch for all the reasons you need to watch, you know, for, for lighting, for performance, for all of it. And now this little camera not only is giving us, you know, the quality that we want um, so that it seamlessly fits in with everything else that we're doing, but it also gives us the ability to monitor what's happening while it's happening. You know, I'm curious, and I'm going to throw this one to David. With all the connections that the camera has, like you mentioned earlier, SDI, the inclusion of Genlock, and timecode ports, how has that, or how do you feel that it's going to change your process for capturing some of the filming for, say, driving plates? Yeah, it really for array work, where you're now having multiple cameras, um, essentially you're creating one big camera by combining a lot of smaller cameras together into one system. Uh, the, the ability to have the image from each of those cameras being captured at exactly the same instant in time uh, becomes really important, especially if you're trying to merge that footage together into a large kind of panorama, which is a lot of what we do. Uh, with the GH line, uh, we've had to basically kind of uh, build a custom trigger system and a custom power system that gets us really close, we're within a frame, but we don't have that line level sync. And, and that's something that we've always been, uh, been wanting to have, because as, as we're stitching things together, having those frames be identical is, is pretty important. Um, so now that we have Genlock uh, in, in the box camera, that's no longer an issue. We can Genlock all the cameras together, and they essentially act as one large unit. Um, and then time code now means that it makes the process of syncing that footage and, and bringing that into a, a timeline and having all of those, the, those different uh, clips line up perfectly in time uh, is now a one button solution. We, we basically just hit the time code sync button uh, in the editing system and all of the footage is in perfect sync. So it's radically sped up our process and increased the quality of the final product um, just from this one kind of technical thing. So yeah, we've been, we've been waiting for these features for a long time. So it's good that it's finally here. So to hear, as someone who streams as well, you know, there's a, something cool about having a higher quality camera that you can place anywhere in your studio. So I'm curious because I know in the time that you had to work with this camera, the Lumix Tether for Multicam app wasn't available yet. 
Now, since it's coming with the camera and it's gonna give you full control from your computer, meaning you don't have to get up and go touch the camera to change your ISO, focus, aperture, and other settings, how important is that in your opinion for flexibility of streamers, YouTubers, and other content it's, creators? It's everything. Um, because I, especially for somebody like me, I've said it before, like a lot of the stuff that I do, I do on my own. So to be able to have like basically my, my mission control center up and I can adjust everything and I don't have to get up and I mean, cause I mean, we've all done it before. If you have to film something on yourself by yourself, you get up, you turn the camera on, you sit down and then you have to get up, press stop and look at it to make sure that you were centered and all of that. It's, it's a lot. So to have that all at your computer and you're like, oh, you know, I need to change the ice a little bit because it's coming in a little bit. Like to do all of that from your computer is, I mean, without having to get back up and, and review the footage and then fast forward, like, oh, this is me just getting up to go look at the footage. Like all of that is, so annoying when you're doing it by yourself so to be able to take basically turn yourself into a team like now i am talent producer director all from the same seat i don't have to get up and then put on another hat and then go review the footage and all of that so it, it really has changed the game I, I can't wait till i get mine in the mail from you guys because i just i just know it's coming i've been praying on this i've been fasting i stopped eating carbs about a week ago just so i can show my commitment so how much I'm looking forward to this. So there's a cool feature that the camera has specifically for streamers and broadcasters. So for people like you and me that are doing this all the time, you have the ability through this app to control up to 12 cameras via ethernet. So thinking about this, do you see in your production a use case for setting up multiple camera angles easily? Sean, let me tell you something, okay? Uh, the, 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 the night that I use this camera, uh, I didn't realize how clear it was going to be. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm ready for the world to, to take all of this in. It's a lot, Sean. Okay? Just, <laughs> I mean, just off the pictures I post on Instagram, the DMs are going crazy. But if they got three different angles with that type of quality, Sean, I don't know if my marriage will survive. Okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to be a good person. I'm trying to be in my daughter's life. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be there. It's a lot, Sean, because... Like, I had never seen anything like this on a streaming platform. Like, this is the quality of Netflix. This is the quality of Hulu. This is the quality of Prime. So for someone to be doing this in their living room, man, it is, I can't say game changer enough, and I, I can't really think of any, like, any synonyms for, like, game changer right now. So I'm just keep saying game changer. Okay, it's a game changer. Game changer. Just keep saying <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it's amazing, man. I, I cannot wait for, you know, receive my three cameras so I can <laughs> use this Ethernet wire. I knew that was coming. Somehow I figured... He set me up, David. David, how, I how would I not walk through that door? Of course I'm going to walk through that door. He said, it all. oh, you get multiple cameras. Oh, multiple, you say. You, you don't say. I don't mind if I do. But I'll just take one, two. One work. All right, all right. You know, we'll 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 uh, you know, I'll 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 have my my people get in touch with yours. There you go. It's just me. I, I told you. I told you, Sean. I don't have, I don't have any people. It's just me. <laughs> have your people get in contact with me. Okay, that's that's all I got to do. Fair enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. So I want to kind of round this out with a little bit of a call out for everybody. So to hear, where can everybody find you online and check out all the goodness that you've been talking about, man? Okay, uh, you can catch me on Instagram, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. It's all to hear more, T-A-H-I-R-M-O-O-R-E, and my YouTube as well. Uh, we're having a great time, man. My Patreon is really taking off. People are taking to, you know, the dad bods are in right now. You know, I didn't know that this was going to happen. Um, I've been approached by Vanity. I've been approached by Vogue. It's a beautiful time to have a, a dad bod. Uh, I never thought that boob sweat for me, for men, would be so... So profitable. So I'm, I'm thankful of all the times that I didn't go to the gym, but very easy to find. Very easy to find. I'm out here, fam. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Jean, uh, what, what about you? Where, where can everyone uh, find you and, and follow your work? Yeah, so um, you can usually look at my website, which is just my name, JeanTyson.com. Also Instagram, same thing, JeanTyson. Um, I have... A couple of projects. One I started during the pandemic, which was to raise money for the LA Food Bank because everybody's really struggling right now. Um, everybody was struggling before the pandemic made it worse, and 
My friend, who's also a DP, and I created this Instagram page called Directors of Photography, where <laughs> we essentially created a bake sale um, for everybody here in LA. I couldn't ship worldwide, um, <laughs> but we could do a socially distanced bake sale where people could place orders through Instagram and Venmo, and uh, we bake sourdoughs and and cookie and cookies and brownies and stuff, and then all of the money went to the food bank, and we raised enough for over a hundred thousand meals for people here in LA. So that's directors of photography, um, D O U G H, <laughs> um, and then also. My latest um, project that just premiered a couple of weeks ago is called Black Boys. It's on NBC Peacock, their streaming service. Um, and it's about black men in America and eliminating their humanity and uh, greatness in our country. So check that out on Peacock. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, and David, where can uh, uh, everybody find you and, and check out your work? Sure. Um, so on all the different social platforms, I'm David C. Smith DP. Um, when you've got the last name Smith, sometimes you got to use the middle initial in there. And then when it's David Smith, you got to also add the DP at the end. So um, getting my own URL was never going to be a, a, a part of the cards. Um, but, you know, first world problems. Uh, and then drivingplates.com, like we mentioned before, that's my company. So if, uh, if anybody needs to reach me, they can always do so through there. Uh, and I can vouch that John's sourdough is probably the best loaf of bread I've ever eaten. So, yeah. Awesome. Well... I want to thank everyone for taking the time out of your day. I really appreciate it. And I know the viewers really appreciate it as well. It's one thing to hear our engineers or Matt or myself talk about the camera from the ultra technical brand side, but to hear use cases and opinions of how the camera worked in the real world, I think is one of the more important things for someone who's looking to get this camera for themselves. So again, thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to join us for this Q&A session. And with that, I want to jump over and bring Matt Frazier back into the conversation to address some of the questions that you guys, the community, have been submitting through this presentation. As you guys may have noticed, we've had the team answering some of the questions already, but they've also collected some for Matt and I to address live. So how's it going, Matt? I'm doing awesome. I can't wait to get some of these questions answered in the Q&A. Yeah, yeah. So um, again, yeah, thank, thank you everybody for uh, submitting your questions on all the different platforms that we've been streaming this on. Uh, so we have a bunch here that we've been collecting throughout, uh, as we said before. Um, so Matt, let's jump right into it. There's a lot of questions about the um, streaming capabilities uh, with this camera. Um, questions from wireless streaming versus uh, the actual tethered Ethernet streaming. Uh, could you touch a little bit on some of those questions as well? A lot of those came from the DP Review uh, multicast that's also going on today. Yeah, so just real quick, I want to say thank you to uh, DP Review, CineD, Video Maker for all participating in this live stream. Uh, this is a first attempt for us to do a multicast, sending get out of multiple platforms. Uh, so we're very excited to give this a try. Um, with that said, for the DP review questions, and I'm, frankly, I've been following the chat. I know there's been a lot of questions about what can be done wired versus what can be done wireless. Um, at the time the product ships, the camera over Ethernet or USB will be able to stream a signal. You're going to get about uh, 1280 by 960 or 1280 by 720 resolution at that launch time. In the future, we're going to be doing an update that adds um, RTSP, RTP support. Uh, we are being somewhat cryptic about the resolutions that we're going to support right now. You know, some of this is we want to be a little secretive. I promise you're going to get very good quality resolutions from it as we do that. As to Wi-Fi, as of right now, the Wi-Fi implementation is primarily going to revolve around our app. Um, be able to use the Lumix Sync app with the camera. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't explore doing Wi-Fi in the future. Uh, we have other cameras like our X1500 and X2000 that can do um, RTMP streaming over Wi-Fi. So it's not that it's foreign to us. Uh, we're just not ready to talk about it quite yet. Yeah, yeah, very cool. So um, let's let's jump down this list of questions that we have here uh, continuing on. Sure, um, absolutely. From our... Uh, Lumix Global site, uh, the Lumix Global YouTube channel, um, we've had a number of questions about ND filters. Could you touch on that topic a little bit for us? 
Yeah, you know, it's something we really would love to have incorporated into the box camera, but you sort of have a clash of needs. So we wanted to make the camera really small, very narrow, so that we could put two of them side by side for VR applications as well as for 3D applications. When you do that, you really remove a lot of space where you would have to be able to move the neutral density filters out of the way of the sensor. So if we don't have space to move the ND filter, we can't incorporate it. Now, I realize some people will be out there saying, well, just use an electronic ND, you know, something like this put into place that's like an LCD panel that can be darkened or brightened. The problem there is that that will immediately cost you roughly a, a stop of light. So you're going to have a camera that has to use higher ISOs or higher gain in order to fight through that ND filter. So at the end of the day, we prioritize reducing the size, making sure that it would work in different applications, in particular for VR, for array camera applications. And at the end of the day, the neutral density filter had to be uh, sacrificed. Yeah, yeah, definitely understandable. So um, the next question we have here is also from the Lumix Global site, um, and it actually sure. involves the cooling system on the camera. Uh, the question is, how loud is the fan and can the speed be changed? It's quieter than a DC-10. I can promise that. Um, I'm, 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 I'm joking. The fan is incredibly quiet. Anybody who's used an S1H can confirm this. Frankly, if you've ever seen our X1500 or X2000 camcorders, they incorporate a very similar fan design. It is very quiet. You have multiple different settings that you can set the fan to. Frankly, in most applications, like what I'm doing right now, it's not even operating. Um, I'm on a box camera. Sean is on a box camera right now. Um, I have never heard the fan in the box camera ever once. Um, yep. I don't know about Sean, but but personally, I've never even heard it kick on. Um, that doesn't mean it won't with certain recording at, um, formats. I haven't tested it yet with like 4K, 60P, but I have actually turned the camera's fan on and forced it to high. Mm -hmm. And when I heard it in that application, it was very quiet. Yeah, and, and to add into that, you know, just like we were saying before, I've been using the box camera for the Lumix live streams, and we broadcast at 1080 60p. Uh, and typically, because I have the camera plugged in all the time, and it's always running, I usually will either set the camera to normal fan, so the, just the where it constantly runs, not based on internal thermal, it just runs. And it, the fact is, I'm using a separate microphone. I'm arm's length away from the camera here, you're never going to hear it in 90% of the platforms that you're going to use it in. Uh, it it's, it's just really a non-issue. And to put it in perspective, cam other cameras of this caliber that are cinema-style cameras, turn one of them on and listen to the fans that those cameras have because you know you're not necessarily recording audio internally. And we are leagues quieter than anything like that in the market, I think. Well, and I think one last point on this before we get to the, la the next question, um, it's a trade-off. So we could have loaded a lot more metal into the camera design. Um, you know, some companies have no fan in a box design and their cameras tip the scales at over 900 grams. You know, this camera is at 400 and it's just under 440 grams. So you're dealing with a much lighter weight camera. You either add metal to get the heat out of the chassis or we include a fan and we use a you know, it, it's a it's a coreless fan design that's very quiet, um, and that helps get the heat out. It gives us a much lighter system to be able to work with. So I exactly. prefer having a lighter camera. That, that I think it's a better choice. Yeah, yeah, it, it, definitely. Um, now, uh, let's see. We, we have another question here that that's actually coming from the, uh, again, from DP Review. And I think uh, this is a bit more of a complicated question, but um, I want to touch on it here. Um, there's a lot of people asking about NDI support uh, on this camera. Could you dive into a little bit of info on that? Yeah, so there's nothing that would necessarily preclude us from incorporating NDI into the camera. Um, I can tell you that as of right now, NDI is not a plan for the product. Um, we sort of have to look at different use cases for a camera and where we think it's most likely to be supported. And when we started looking at the market, we felt like the, the OBS platform would be a big platform for this particular product. And within OBS, we can work with what we have existing and what our plans are through our TSP. So it didn't make a lot of sense for us to start 
licensing NDI technologies that would ultimately have to be passed on to the end user as a licensing fee or a licensing charge. Um, if we were going to support something like NDI, we would probably support the NDI HX platform to optimize image quality, to also reduce the resources that are required for your computer to be able to work with it and to expand its control functionality. Um, but as of right now, there's no plans for it. I just want to make sure we, we understand, everybody understands the why. Um, keep feeding up the questions. We'll, we'll absolutely send them back to our engineers in Japan. We'll let them know that there was a lot of interest in NDI. That was one of the biggest questions that I noticed on the chat. It's also one of the biggest questions that Sean has noticed. So yeah. we're going to pay attention to it. We'll send it up to Japan and ask them if, if it's something that can be added in the future firmware. Yeah. Uh, now, there are a couple comments. Uh, this one actually comes from Cine D, uh, And I think it's actually more of a point of some clarity on the um, bit depth and uh, chroma subsampling on the camera. Um, the... BGH1 is capable of 422 10-bit recording internally. Um, could you give us uh, the kind of the high level of what the 422 10-bit capabilities are for this camera? Yeah, I think that that's some of the dangers of reading the, uh, the rumors websites that are out there because they don't always get all the information. Um, <laughs> so the camera has the ability to record 422 10-bit internal up to 4K at 30 frames per second. So that's you know, it's 4K, 25, 24th, and 2398. It also has the ability to work with 10-bit um, up to 60p, 422-10-bit. The only thing it can't record internally is 422-10-bit, 4K, 60p. It can still do 420-10-bit, 4K, 60p internal. So you absolutely have internal 10-bit, 422. It's just limited to 4K, 30. When we output over HDMI, that gives you the ability now to get 422-10-bit, if need be, for 4K, 60p. Yeah. Hopefully that clarifies things. Yeah, yeah, that that I think definitely addresses some of that uh, question there. Um, and 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 I can prom I can promise you in the U.S. Uh, press release, I 100% made sure that that was all included in the U.S. press release. So you should, if you go back to the U.S. press release, you'll see it says that. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, jumping down to one of the other questions here, which comes from the uh, Lumix Live uh, U.S. Uh, broadcast that we're doing. Uh, the question here is, um, how about audio? How do you monitor the audio being recorded into the camera via the Tether app? So that is a terrific question, and it's one that Sean and I can't 100% answer at this point. Um, until we see the RTSP implementation and the future updates to the app, I don't know what the future brings. I can only tell you what. Oh, and we just lost, lost Matt's uh, video. So, we're... so today oh, we don't output... Okay, so we, we don't have the ability um, to monitor the audio through the Linux Tether app today with it as it's implemented. So you're gonna monitor just through the micro, the headphone jack on the camera itself. That's how you'll monitor it today. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's, Again, that's pretty that's much only if you're using the Tether. That's if you're using the Tether app. Obviously, if you're using an HDMI out, you're using an external switcher, there's a whole other way of being able to do things like that. Yeah, and, and that's kind of how I, I basically have been using it. I have the camera plugged in with PoE plus power for Ethernet, sending that over. Uh, and then when we do multicam work, um, depending on if I need to share like my desktop or something like that, then it's plugged into my ATEM. So I can monitor audio a couple of different ways. But being able to plug right back into the, the headphone jack on the camera is going to give you the most direct audio capture there. Um, now, uh, following up here, uh, there was a question posted on DP Review, which uh, obviously I'm going to you know, toss this one over to you because um, it's way more fitting for you. Um, is this camera compliant okay. for Netflix? All right. So that, that's a sticky subject because we don't have any control over that. Um, Netflix will approve what Netflix wants to approve. Uh, they have very specific standards. So... I can say that it incorporates time code, which is something that Netflix looks for in a camera, and it's on a standardized um, SDI terminal. So it doesn't require your sound guy to have to bring special adapters or anything to make it work. So that's a positive. Um, we certainly hope the dynamic range is more than adequate to be able to meet their needs. Um, we certainly see use cases, especially for arrays of cameras uh, or for you know, anything that's comedy related, anything that's live event that they're doing, certainly benefits to being able to use a product like this. Um, so it includes all those things. Plus, I think Genlock creates a completely new 
uh, reason to consider the product, especially when you're doing array work. So um, we're hopeful, but ultimately that's really up to Netflix. And I don't have a lot of direct communication with them on this camera. So we'll have to just wait and see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> here's another question that's actually really right up your alley, Matt. Um, this comes from the Lumix Global channel, uh, and it's asking, will anamorphic D-Squeeze be available in the Lumix Sync app? <laughs> so um, we, we, we've asked for it to be included in the Lumix Sync app. We'll have to see if they're able to incorporate it in a future update. It's not currently available there, but I do want to touch base on a couple of cool things you can do. Um, obviously, we can D-Squeeze over SDI, which is awesome. You can go ahead and D-Squeeze over SDI. Uh, my favorite, and it's, I've, Sean's laughing because we've been messing around with this for the past few weeks now. Um, you can de-squeeze anamorphic over the ethernet or over the USB. So you can actually do anamorphic live streaming and I have been doing it um, for the past couple of weeks now. Uh, I didn't bother to do it for this one, but for a lot of stuff I've been doing, you can ask the guys at DP Review when we were doing some, some talks together, I was anamorphic at the time. Um, so yes, you can absolutely do de-squeezing, just not on the Linux Sync app at this point. Yeah. Um, so let's see, we have time for maybe one or two more questions here. Um, there, let, let me see here. Well, I totally lost my place in our list of questions. Uh, again, everyone in the community that's been viewing this stream on the multiple different platforms that we've been broadcasting this, uh, you guys have had some amazing questions and we know that we can't, uh, always answer all of the questions that, you, that uh, are posted, but uh, you know, we always try to get to the most common questions for what uh, people are asking about. Um, so, so, Sean, here's one, here's one I actually want to get to. So yeah. there's been quite a few questions about um, support. You know, is Panasonic going to make monitors to attach it? Are we going to make accessories? Have we been in conversations with other companies to build accessories for it? Um, is there a PL adapter available for the camera? So number one, yes, there's already a lot of PL adapters available because it's on the micro four thirds mount. Um, so yes, there's there's a plethora of micro four thirds to PL adapters already available. We're already in conversations. I can tell you at least three to four different companies who are already planning on building gauges for the product. Um, we've been in conversation with a couple of monitor manufacturers. We're looking for ways to help further expand the functionality of the product um, in the monitor systems as well. So um, just keep your eyes peeled. Uh, we are definitely, no, no question about it, I've already got CAD drawings to all the major <laughs> cage companies out there. Uh, you're going to be able to find accessories for this product. Yeah. And uh, all right, let's see here. The, the last question that I want to bring up, because there's, there's, again, a lot of people asking specifically, why a 10.2 megapixel sensor in a camera like this? Um, and I think I, hopefully you can give maybe a little bit of a, a peek into it as to where this camera sits compared to something like a GH5, GH5S, or even the S5, because there's a lot of people comparing them together. So I, again, I think you look at the market as a whole, you have to also kind of look at where you're targeting a certain market segment, right? Um, so, you know, on the one hand, you can use micro four thirds mount and put a smaller sensor than micro four thirds and kind of put it into a box design use it for streaming applications. Uh, but then you're really sort of hindering its low light sensitivity. You can then use a, or you could just use a photo sensor um, to get higher resolution. But again, we're starting to sacrifice low light sensitivity to be able to do that. Uh, since this camera really doesn't have a lot of photography functions, um, that's a misnomer, by the way. If you use the Lumix Tether app with the camera, uh, you can absolutely take photos with it. It can be used as a photographic camera because we see industrial applications where that might be very useful to be able to use it as just a photo camera. Um, so 10 megapixels is really going to give us exactly 40, 96 pixels of width for the full sensor output. So that gives us the exact number of pixels we need for cinema 4K capture. And by sticking to that, it gives us the biggest diodes we can fit in the camera, which gives us the best low light sensitivity. Then you add in our dual native ISO functionality, and that gives us even better dynamic range. It also gives us a better high ISO point. And then really last but not least, it helps us with refresh rates so we can have faster readout speeds. So the camera has very low instances of rolling shutter. Uh, if we increase the resolution, you're gonna increase the amount of rolling shutter that you'll typically see. So it's, it's a balancing act. This is a video camera first and foremost, and it's a 4K video camera. So sticking to the right number of pixels for 4K gives us the least amount of rolling shutter, the best low light sensitivity, the greatest dynamic range. And that's why we did that. Yeah. 
Well, cool. Um, I want to thank you, Matt, for for taking the time and, and doing the questions with us. And I want to thank, again, all of you that have joined us from any of the platforms that you're you're viewing on. Um, like Matt said, this was a first, uh, you know, kind of attempt for us on multicasting and broadcasting out to as many platforms as we can to get all of you the information about this new camera. Uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation this Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time during our normally scheduled Lumix Live uh, broadcast, which is on the Lumix Cameras YouTube channel. So make sure on whatever platform you are viewing on, whether it's the Lumix channels or any of the other platforms, DP Review, Video Maker, or CineD, make sure to like, subscribe, and comment on their channels. Uh, it helps YouTube platform out. It helps all of us get this information out to you guys and have these kinds of conversations. And with that, like I said, see everybody on Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time on the Lumix Cameras YouTube channel. Thanks, everybody.